welcome to the Film Illogical Society, brought to you by Redacted Media and 6-5 Media. In today's episode, we look at another one of the essentials. And now, here are your hosts, Chris Scholes and T.C. DeWitt. All right, and welcome back to another episode of The Essentials Show, where we talk about the films that are essential for any film study type people. Filmaholics, is that a word? That's a word now. Cinephiles, Cinephiles. And, and alleged, alleged essentials. Alleg- Let's put a yeah, we, we on decide that. whether these films are essential or not. So far, all but one have been consensus. Yes, we should watch these. Yes. So, I am one of your hosts. I'm Chris Scholes. With me, as usual, is TC DeWitt. Hello, TC. How are you? Uh, hello, Chris. It is so good to be here with you today. I will not maintain this accent through the whole review. And that is, I am, I am grateful for that. Yes, today's, <laughs> today's film, we're going all the way back to 1937 for The Grand Illusion or La Grande Illusion. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a, a film by a French director, Jean Renoir. Um, the Son of the famous Impressionist painter. Uh, really? Yes. For, I did not know that. Yes. That's, well, you know, that's just not fair when you got a legacy family. It's like, oh, uh, one of the uh, greatest painters of all time. What are you going to do, son? I'm going to be a very influential uh, director. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so I, <laughs> it's very good. Very good. There. Um, I, I will. This is a just a. Just a standard disclaimer we're going to put in the front of this. We will be mis- mispronouncing many, many names today. Probably probably all of them. Probably all of them, including Jean Renoir. Yes. We'll probably butcher that. Christ, um, Christ, Christ. Listen to me, Christ. Uh, Schulze. Shul- Listen. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Taka. Taka. Crushed it. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, and, no, in all honesty, there, the, the, this, this film is just, as you could imagine, 1937, made in France, packed, jam packed with French actors. Yes. And, and some German. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Some German. But uh, it, we'll, we'll get into that. Sure, sure, sure. So, um, I had seen this film maybe 20 years ago or so at film school. Mm-hmm. When I went, this was one of the films we had seen um, at least two from Jean Renoir. And I remember, so you had, you had requested, Hey, let's watch a, let's watch a war movie. I think we need a war movie next. Yeah. Yeah. And this film came and came to mind. And the more I researched it after suggesting it, the more I was happy with this suggestion, just because of the way that this film is received or, mm-hmm. you know, was received at the time and is still currently received and um, revered by so many um, influential uh, filmmakers. But you had never seen this film. So I, yeah. <laughs> what going in, what what did you think? Like when I made the suggestion, had you had you seen or heard of Jean Renoir before? I knew of Jean Renoir. That's a name that as far as cinema goes. It's a name I recognized. As far as this movie is concerned, I had never even heard of it. <laughs> so in the question of is this an essential or not, before I watched it, I could wholeheartedly say, no, this is not an essential. I've never heard of it. And, and I know a lot of movies I've seen. Do. I've seen thousands at this point. At I've been in 10. conversations. At least 10. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but no, I, I going into this, I thought, come on, Chris, you just picked. This was the most pretentious pick <laughs> you could have come up with. Oh, oh, and, and it's French. Great. <laughs> French and German. <laughs> and, and a My little bit God. of Russian and some English. Yeah, that's right. This thing is jam packed with with film snobbery of the 30s. So going into it, my thoughts were this that. couldn't possibly be an essential film because it's not one that ever has come up in conversation that I've had to fake my way through. <laughs> OK. OK. And I think this. Yeah. All right. So I had, I had shared. So so just to talk a little bit of historically, um, some of the figures. So when asked 
um, on the spot. Orson Welles asks, if you could save two films on the arc and they cannot be your own, which two films would you pick? Orson Welles said Grand Illusion mm-hmm. and another film. That was What's his answer because he couldn't think of it. Oh, <laughs> He couldn't think. It must have been so, the younger Orson Welles that he didn't answer his he, own film. Well, so he couldn't. For, he couldn't the, answer his own films. This was like in the 70s, an interview in the 70s. Gotcha. So he had gotcha. picked this. Um, this film is is the favorite, one of the favorites of Scorsese, of Woody Allen. Um, it is the first foreign film to be nominated for Best Picture Oscar. Hmm. Interesting. Ever. It I'd is. I imagine this is a contemporary of Hitchcock, so I imagine he really liked it. Yeah. Um, yes. It um, it won um, because of the themes of this film. Um, it won um, a special award at the uh, Venice Film Festival. So the mm-hmm. top award at the time was named after Mussolini. The themes of this film are very anti-war. Mm-hmm. And so they were like, well, we can't give this film the Mussolini Award. So they gave they created a new award that this film won um, for basically best film without using Mussolini's name. Probably for the best. <laughs> Probably for the best. I, I find it fascinating that this is 1937 just what three years before world war ii broke out and this is set during world war one it's a very weird place in time for a movie like this to exist it is particularly because i don't quite consider this a war film it certainly takes place in a po in pow camps and it deals with soldiers it's it's certainly an anti-war film because like yeah. nobody in here is talking about the glory and honor of patriotism there's the two there's darth vader so the guy in the neck brace <laughs> <laughs> talking to uh, Vincent Price's mustache, uh, David Niven's mustache. I'll go with yeah, that. David era. Niven would be better. Yeah, 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 yeah. The two of them talking about dying in wars considered uh, dying in battle. That's that's an honorable death. And well, the, neither of them can can even agree on that. They're like, no, yeah. that's not an honorable death. That's a terrible death. Well, there, you know. So I, I think um, there's a couple things going on there. There's um, um, class warfare going on here too, kind of. Um, some people I call like World War One was the last gentleman's war. Oh, yeah, that's a perfect way to put it because and, you've never yeah. seen a more comfortable, cushy POW camp. <laughs> yeah, because um, you know, because the the we, we follow a group of officers. Um, um, so there's uh, uh, Marichal, who's kind of the main. Person we follow, we start with him and we end with yeah. him. It's Kenneth Branagh. Yeah, Jean Gabin, who is uh, considered like the best French actor at the time. Was he the sidekick? No, he was Marshall. Oh, Marshall. Okay, yeah. okay. His yeah. his real name is Jean Gabin. Okay, yeah. um, very ha- very handsome guy. He, he handsome. did look like he could be Kenneth Branagh's relative. <laughs> yeah, he he definitely did. Um, so he is like a working class, but he, you know, he's obviously he grew up in, in the city of Paris. So is, is, you know, he's a mechanic. So he was able to work on planes and planes were new in World War One. So he was an officer because of that. So he did not have a great upbringing. He also had um, 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 Rosenthal, who mm-hmm. was a. That's the sidekick. Uh, yeah, he was a Jewish um, who, who, you know, banker basically in France. So they, you know, a new, new rich money. And then you had the, um, the captain, uh, mm. Boldu, who, Boldu. who came from, uh, uh, you know, a r- aristocratic family. Certainly. They yeah. had money yeah. and yeah. all that. And, and so you, all three of them were officers and so they were treated better than a common soldier would be in a POW camp, certainly. Yeah, there's a strange respect, even like right from the get go. Yeah. A plane is shot down, which is Marshall's plane. And the, I keep, keep calling him Darth Vader because he had the neck brace. Well, Rothenstein. Like, Rothenstein says, uh, if they are officers, invite them to dinner. 
and yeah. we and like these men are welcomed into this dinner and even when they come in celebrating shooting down the plane and and the the killing of a soldier and like the celebration of uh, I shot down my second plane yeah the the german shoulder apologizes to the, I'm sorry this was bad timing uh, please I I respectfully apologize for the, like what so yeah calling it the last gentleman's war yes yeah <laughs> that is correct because yeah no 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 <laughs> that's not <laughs> how things go so it's it's so so the you know if if you're looking for general plot it's it's an escape film um mm -hmm. this is one of the first films to um historically to be centered in a POW camp um multiple POW camps um and and in it they're they're trying to escape they they start with one where where a group of french are trying to dig a tunnel and they're almost through and then they transfer all they of them to different out. prisons and mm -hmm. then um they end up at the at the prison that that is uh, supposedly inescapable yeah it's up on a cliff it's an old castle yep. there's like one way really in or out of that place so Unless and the you got same, a really long rope right and the same captain uh Rothenstein, now he had suffered injuries um, so his his skin was basically all burnt. He had to wear a back brace and a and a neck guard, so he couldn't really move. He's Which is now, why I keep referring to him as Darth Vader. Uh, yeah, and he's now the <laughs> uh, the guard. So that he is played by Eric von Straheim, who is another like big name. He's a big name actor at this time. Like if you look at him, that's the look that all like German bad guys going forward mm -hmm. like that's his look like mm -hmm. like the in 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 Raiders of the Lost Ark the 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 German who burns his hand mm -hmm. on on the icon looks exactly like Eric von Straheim <laughs> like it is like like uncanny like how all like okay he's German and he's he's a commander or whatever he's got to look like this mm -hmm. which is so strange because he's not a bad guy. No, he's on the opposing side, but there's this insane respect between him himself and the captain. But yeah, uh, to the point where <coughs> at each other, at his deathbed to to speak with Bojo. He's, he's crying. Like, this, is, this isn't fair. I respect. I, I didn't mean to. I, this is a, a decades old movie. It's nearly yeah. 100 years old. So certainly talking spoilers here. But the yeah, like the respect between those officers is wild. And yeah. It's, so yeah, so he's to to make him this prototype. That's what German villains should look like. When in reality, if you really look at this movie, there there aren't any villains. There aren't any real bad guys in this. There's just people on the other side of the fight. And and I think that was part of uh, Renoir's what he wanted to do. He wanted to humanize war a little bit, right? Like very he progressive. Very yeah. progressive. I mean, it's not it's not. Um, you know, French and, and Russians versus Germans. And I, it was, you know, these are all people yeah. and they're all people in different stations and, and people trying to do things. And, and, you know, yeah, people. They're people, just humans and they yep. always, they are all soldiers. They all miss their wives and families. Like there's one woman in this. No, there's a nurse. There's like very few, uh, very few really, women. There's a really sweet moment where, they're they're putting on they're gonna put on a Christmas show, and they get a crate of articles of clothing, and there's a dress in there, and they they got the they make the kid with the uh, the shaven like the cleanest face with the least amount of hair on his chest put on the dress, and as soon yeah. as he steps out, everyone's just like looking at a woman, yeah, and it's it's a really neat moment where it's just silent, and everyone the Russians, the Germans, the French, the, they're all just staring at, it, and it's this moment of. It's it's said often the similarities here of like I miss my wife yeah I miss my family I miss my home what were you before this what are you going to do afterwards between everyone it's yeah. it yeah it's a, it's this very human story it's, it's 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 incredible it's one of those and and I I do want to talk about that scene so we can talk about it now so I it, it just like that scene how it was filmed so um, traditionally film made in the thirties and all that. Um, it'd be more more likely to show 
uh, close-ups of reaction shots and kind of cut between each oh, person in there. You go back a little further, look at the, we did Metropolis for this podcast. So looking yeah. at how many, there's a lot of close-up reactions. It's a silent film. So there's in that, but yeah, certainly in the tradition of the era, a lot of close-ups. So in, in what, Jean Renoir did is he put the the camera on on a pivot and he just panned slowly to show like and, and, and you get a really good sense of how many prisoners of war are in that in this little uh, room shed. Yeah. Yeah. And they're all I mean, just like like when the soldier comes out in the dress, like all like the energy is just sucked out. Because everyone is brought back to, like you said, like I I miss my I miss wife. That. I miss. It was it. I, I saw echoes echoes of that moment. I can think of a couple things, but there's a, a moment like that similar in Bing Crosby, uh, Irvin Bergman's White Christmas, which is at the very beginning of the movie where uh, Bing Crosby is singing "I'll Be Home" or "I'm Dreaming of White Christmas" and just pans over the sh- soldiers all just longingly thinking about. Mm-hmm missing home and maybe not even being able to ever get back there. It's a, it, I would, wouldn't have minded if that moment in the, the grand illusion here was longer. It's, it, it's this nice lingering moment, and it's, it's beautifully handled. It's just speaks a lot towards what this story is about. The humanity of this, I suppose yeah. the title alone speaks of what this movie is about. The grand illusion of, what is war? <coughs> what does it mean to be a soldier? At least that's my interpretation of of the title is that this is about the the illusions we carry when we think about our enemy. They're they're fighting on the other side, yeah. but they're 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 still humans. They're still they're people. Still humans. Yeah, we can relate to them. They can relate to us. We're not. And again, I and I think you you look at the differences. You know. Yeah, in in two years or or whatever, when when World War Two fully breaks out. Yeah, and that's it, that's a, I don't want to diminish the import of how evil some sides of war can be. Certainly, right. going into World War Two, you're talking about the genocide of millions and yeah. millions of people. And that is inconscionable, I, and, and just just yeah. following orders is not an excuse. And and I think what's different is that is that there there wasn't the mass killing the mass genocide of a people there wasn't right as the killing of civilians i think that's why jean renoir called it the last gentleman's war um because uh, and if you think of most war movies world war ii films and beyond up to this day often more often than not it's it's very it's almost propaganda yeah absolutely these are the heroes don't get me wrong there's a place for that in storytelling to have very clear indications of good versus evil. Love it. The majority of cinema and storytelling is built upon that, but it's nice every now and then to see a film like this, which doesn't paint any side as evil. And granted it's because of the war of, because of world war one being mm-hmm. the type of war it was uh, the era of film. It's, it's not, it's not important to say like evil, uh, not evil, uh, good, like angels and devils. It's not, it's not that kind of story to be told. It really yeah. does come down to that, that Renoir's uh, hope to tell a story about humanity as, as I'm understanding you explaining that's, it's, it's beautifully handled then. I mean, just even, even like the conversations between Raffenstein and Boldu, like, um, they're making connections. They know many of the same people. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Talking um, about I know uh, I knew say uh, 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 he was. Uh, it's like yeah, that was my cousin. <laughs> yeah. Um, How is he? Oh, he lost his arm. Married a rich woman. Good for him. Yeah. Right. <laughs> it's it's interesting too. So like the the use of language. So um, and and again, this is kind of that class. So so Marshall being the working class, he knows French and that's all he knows. That's it. He's, he starts to pick up on a little bit of German, nice little bit broken of German. German by the yeah. end of it, which was really sweet. Yep. Um, you have the, um, uh, Rosenthal who knows French and German since he, he grew up in Austria and he moved to his family, moved to France. So mm-hmm. he, he knows those. Um, but 
the aristocrats, both Rothenstein and Boldu, when they want to have private conversations, they talk in English. Yeah. Because yeah. the uh, all, all the German soldiers, all the other prisoners of war, for the most part, they're not going to be able to understand them at all. Mm-hmm. So so when Rothenstein is begging, begging Boldu to come back, I don't want to kill you. He's Get saying back. that in English because he knows his soldiers that are next to him can't understand it'll, what he's saying. It'll just sound like he's like yelling at the man right now. Yeah. Like, please, I don't want to do this. Right. Please come back here. I mean, it, it, it to me that like that is just um, a brilliant understanding of things. Like if you're going to use. If you're going to, you know, have a, you know, multiple languages in the film, you know, have a purpose behind it. And yeah. and I thought that was brilliant just just to know that, like, oh, like they're speaking English now. And and they obviously both have a good handle on English. Mm-hmm. I It reminded me of or I suppose this reminds me of this is uh, Inglorious Bastards and the importance of uh, Hans Landa being able to speak French and German mm-hmm. and English, like, and his clever use of that in even just the opening of the movie. But uh, <laughs> I, certainly Tarantino being the master of the remix <laughs> most definitely drew inspiration from this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, but yeah. that, yeah, that language barrier, the, the power of language. And really, if you want to talk about anti-war, nothing is, nothing can solve war more and, and end war better and faster than conversation, actually yeah. speaking to each other. Like every, yeah. every, every war, whether it's a, a grand war that we see on the, the world scale or a war at home, when it comes down to it, communication is key. And knowing how to speak to someone and knowing what language to speak to someone is going to solve a whole hell of a lot of problems. Communication is key is what I'm saying. Communication here, is key. I, I would agree. <laughs> oh, yeah. So I... We'll, we'll get into a story in a little bit, mm-hmm. but based on everything I, I, I've said so far, so I would, we're going to get to the, to the essential part right now in the middle, sure. but actually before we do that, let's take a sponsor break. Oh, okay, great. Yeah. I, I'm going to grab a glass of water too here. So I'll go ahead and throw them old sponsors on. Okay. We'll let's hear it. And chips. Yep. Yep. I'm going to do some Christmas shopping when we get back. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ryan. And I'm Mike. And we we are brothers-in-law. We both love beer and are amateur home brewers. Wait, so does that make us... (laughs) Brothers-in-law? I believe so. Every episode, we will talk about aspects of beer and home brewing. But nothing super technical because we're learning this too. So join us as we sit down together and dive into something beer-related. Whether it's a little field research, tasting a certain beer style, or beer from a specific brewery. Talk about our experiences brewing beer at home, including our own solo brews, as well as themed competitions we'll set up along the way. We will also talk about some of our favorite aspects of brewing, like hops, extra ingredients, building our brew cave, and more. And of course, our own misadventures that have happened along the way. So if you like beer, are home brewing already, or if you have an interest in home brewing and don't know where to start, join us on Brewers in Law podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And make sure to follow us on Twitter at Brewers in Law and check out our website brewersinlaw.com. Cheers. Cheers. Psst, hey you, come over here. Uh, who me? Yeah, you. Okay. Hey, do you like Zelda? Yeah, I like Zelda. Who oh, doesn't? Oh, yeah? You like video games? Yeah, I dabble. I play them, yeah. Yeah. Do you like listening to people talk about video games? Of course I like listening to people. Who reads anymore? Well, 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 buddy, do I got a podcast for you. It's called Fan Fiction, you know, with the X. Oh. And you can find it on all your major podcast distributors. That sounds amazing. Oh, buddy, you have no idea. One question, though. Why are you in my room?
Are you ready for your winter escape? Prepare your feet for the long trek through miles and miles of European winter wonderland. Get yourself Marshall's finest footwear, the Swiss Alps gentlemen's snowshoes. Impress German widows. Shoes so fine, you'll only need one foot. But don't take it from me. Let's hear some real customer testimonial. I tried to run from the Germans without my Swiss Alp gentleman snowshoes, and I ended up back in the POW camp I escaped from. Next time I escape, I'll be using Marcel's finest footwear. So escape this winter with Swiss Alps snowshoes, available at all POW commissaries now. Oh, that's great! Cool. That Chris, did you? That's you said you're gonna do some Christmas shopping. That sounds yeah, like. Yeah, I, I that think that's like that's good. good. That's good. Yeah, yeah maybe I, get uh, get two for one. Yep. Yeah, apparently, you only need one, but yeah, yeah, I suppose. Would it would a two for one be? Yeah, that's that's, that's a, a good deal. That's it's a called good deal. A twofer, not a loafer. Yeah. <laughs> 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 okay, Ooh. back to the film. <laughs> Um, I, I have a talking point before I, yeah. I know you have your notes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let's get to it. Yeah. Something that struck me about this is it's amusing. It's not, I wouldn't say it's a comedy by any stretch of the imagination. There are some funny bits. So yes, there absolutely. are some funny bits in here. Just some real simple, real funny. Cause it's true moments mm-hmm. of people blowing off steam or I even liked when they, when Marcel and, uh, Rothenstein, uh, like yelled at each other and separated and then immediately he comes back and helps him to his feet. Yeah. Like there is this really wonderful spirit in here. Mm-hmm. And honestly, I've been on your other show for the Filmological Society. <laughs> this is funnier than some of those comedies. <laughs> yeah, I I think so. Um, uh, the other film that I watched um, from Jean Renoir is called The Rules of the Game, mm-hmm. which came out, I think, in 1938. And it is a funny film. It is a it is a <laughs> comedy. It, it it again it deals with different classes. Mm-hmm. Um, but but yeah, so Jean Renoir is able to do comedy really well. And 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 I I'm gonna yeah hundred percent agree with you. Like the way it's not slapstick. It's not over the top comedy. It feels like real, just funny things. Yeah, it Things, feels genuine. It feels yeah. like it, it is funny. It's funny because it's it's true. It feels like people blowing off steam and just finding an excuse to laugh rather than cry. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, so this certainly comes off very theater. This feel it's of the era. Yeah, they're just starting with experimenting with moving the camera. As Which, we discussed earlier, there's one yeah. shot of that we discussed, but there's multiple shots in this movie that the camera moves really interestingly yeah. through the scene. And it's not just filming a stage show, but it still does feel like a stage show. This could very easily be translated to the theater and yeah. bar- barely miss a beat. Yeah. You definitely have set pieces mm-hmm. and, um, you know, and, and something, uh, researching this that I, that I, um, um, you, know, you found found, found interesting, yeah. Found yeah. interesting. So throughout the film, until until the basically that third act, um, the main characters of of Marichal and and Rosenthal at the end, they're always there's always something containing them. So whether it be a a room, or a wall, or something is there that's like holding them in. So when they're oh, in I prison, see. obvious. Yeah. Metaphors, and so yeah, so they're metaphors. always always imprisoned, even just yeah. trying to get to Switzerland. Right. They well, are I mean, by w- being once German. they get once they escape, then it's wide open. Those are the only like exterior, like wide open shots of the entire film are yeah. when they're walking through the mountains, they're walking through the snow, um, yeah, they're, they're escaping, free. they're free. Like it's it's it's. You know, just using those, like thinking of the camera like that, because other than that, like everything, yes, could be on on a on a on a stage. The other work, the other camera work that I found really interesting um, that Renoir did that that again, this is 1937. So a lot of new things are being done, Mm -hmm. but um, using like the window as a frame to bring the outside in. 
So uh, yes. being on the outside of the building, looking at all the people looking out to kind of connect the two mm-hmm. um, and doing it both ways, essentially. But, you know, not only does the, the window frame show them again trapped, but it also it also provides that kind of that the connection between the outside and the inside. Or alternatively, now that you're mentioning it, I'm thinking there's lots and lots of windows in this movie. Yeah. Uh, 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 seeing the world through the small picture that is the window in one of their s- rooms, right? Mm-hmm. Or uh, uh, when he's in the jail cell and he doesn't even have a window. Yeah. Or, or when they get to the woman's house and she opens up the window to talk to the soldier before shutting the world back out again. Right. Yeah, well, interesting. Well observed. I, I hadn't caught that, but now you're mentioning it. I can picture at least a dozen points in the movie where windows are key. Our artists at artists. work. <laughs> it's like his dad so anyway, was a famous artist or something. I know. What the hell? Um, so anyhow, you were moving into the essential conversation. Yeah. This, so. Yeah. So let's go to the essential conversation. I'm, I'm going to just, I mean, I, I kind of made it clear in the opening. I do feel that this film is essential. I think it, it set up a lot of the tropes we now see nowadays, including any prison escape scenes. They're going to be trying to dig the, the scene of them getting rid of the dirt was in how many, how many films, um, you know, the great Hearts escape, war came to mind. Hearts great war. Escape, yeah. Um, um, yeah. So many films where they, they kind of carry the dirt in their pants and just let it go as they go out to the yard as they're digging. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so that trope, the, you know, the fact the, and we're going to get into this a lot in just a little bit, but the utter bravery of your, your Europe's on the precipice of world war two and you push this movie out. Yeah. <laughs> like, well, which is everything yeah, that is against war and like, and mm-hmm. why, I mean the, the one, the, the, the scene that really, there, there's one main female or one female that's really named in this mm-hmm. film. And she is the German. Um, she has a daughter and, and she lives by her, on her, by herself on a farm because her, her dad, her brother, her, her, her brother, husband, her husband a couple brothers, they all had died. Mm-hmm. And Fight, fighting at the biggest battles. In the I'm biggest battles that I'm were German that were German wins. Yeah. They all died. And they show a scene where it, it, it goes to her table, her dining table, and there's mm-hmm. like three chairs that are turned up because she doesn't need them. Yeah. And she says this table has grown too big. And it's just like it's like like oh my gosh, like yeah. it's it, it's very well done. It's not like it's you know she's not she's talking about them, but you know again she's not showing any animosity towards these two French, who for all she knows could have been the ones to shoot them and kill her, yeah, and kill, kill her. Her family. And she protects them. She doesn't even tell, like, when a German soldier comes up and says, hey, how far is it to this? <laughs> and and she just says, and and he's on his way. Um, yeah. And she ends up falling in love with one of them. Yeah. So it's hey, it's talk- it, the, the anti-war push and, and all that, like, in, in to show the humanizing, um, like, those are things that, like, in, in any film, you know, any, any anti-war film, like Platoon, um, whatever like it really humanizes the yeah. the different people in there the, the, the observation that this of this coming out at the precipice of world war ii i think it's very telling when a movie like this is successful mm-hmm. because it speaks to the larger populace not wanting to go to war yeah. war is usually decided by very 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 few people very small number of people decide okay my people are going to die protecting my beliefs and going against your people. And they're going to die protecting your beliefs. But ultimately it should just be the leader. Like, so it, it, I think it says a lot that when movies like this come out, when documentaries or TV shows or or other pieces of cinema that are anti-war that end up being hugely successful, really do speak to 
the greater voice of the people as opposed to those smaller number of decision makers who just want who are going to play soldier and mm-hmm. never even go on a battlefield. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. So now, TC, you came mm-hmm. into this. You mm-hmm. called me pretentious. I did. You... I was ready to. T- I was. This was going to be my review. Uh, thanks for having me, Chris. This is not an essential. That was <laughs> that was going to be how I started the episode. Okay, but. <laughs> Now that you've seen this, now that you have some time to think about it, what are your thoughts on this film? I really enjoyed this movie. I really did. I I love the performances of it. I love the stories here. I love the humanity, as mm-hmm. we've been discussing here, that they touch on with all these these poor soldiers. And even Mar- Marcel himself knows as soon as he makes it to freedom, he's just going to go back to war. Yep. He, he tells the woman... I'll come back for you when the war is over. When this war, and he even says to his to Rothstein, Rosenthal, Ro- Rosenthal, once we we need to go back and end this war. We need to put an end to this war, which is horrible to think about. Yeah, no, you're not going to end a war. You're about to start another one. I know this is a conversation on World War One, but yeah, there's there's so much about this that I've, I'm really impressed by the performances, the the craft of the narrative, the relationships that are established. And then just how it was it was captured here by Jean Renoir, Renoir, uh, Renoir. However, I don't think this would qualify as an essential, as an overall piece of cinema when looking at things like we have when talking about the definitive nature of some of these these films, these these essential films mm-hmm. that can really round out your conversation. Having this in your tool belt, being able to draw on this to have a conversation about war, I think will move you into pretension, right? Because it's going to be a very few people of our millennial era and beyond are going to have, have seen this and it's going to be much more of this academic explanation about why this movie is good, as opposed to saying you like inglorious bastards. You like, uh, you like, a uh, uh, um, th- uh, th- uh, um, freaking jarhead oh man i can't believe you haven't seen la grande illusion right i don't think this is essential to to truly fill out uh a cinematic lexicon like cinematic library but to go back to my compliments here to look at the craft of an anti-war film and have a conversation about it to, to see how you can take a message like this bring humanity to these characters you're going to move into Terrence Malick territory of like thin red line. You'd mentioned platoon. Uh, I already picked Jarhead out of this, but there's, there are anti-war films that are echoes of this. Mm -hmm. And, and in our definition of like, well, if you can name something that was inspired by something, then go backwards until you can't name something anymore. And uh, it's, this feels like, the Iliad or the Odyssey. This feels like Shakespeare. This feels like so classic being set in World War I. That if that is the sort of library you want to create as a film watcher, then yes, I do think this is well worth the watch. So there you go. <laughs> I um just to kind of counter a little bit and kind of Which add is fine. You don't have to agree with me. <laughs> this is the this is spine Number one for the Criterion Collection. This is the first film this of the Criterion Collection? This is the first collection? film of the Criterion Collection. Holy shit. Well, my, my, I, everything I say is invalid. <laughs> <laughs> I did not know that. This yeah. is the first film of the This Criterion? is the first film, the Holy first shit. film of the Criterion Collection. Well, I hope all the compliments I've I've stated here <laughs> rang rang through because I, I just heard pretentious. I heard. <laughs> Ugh, I like I had after watching this even I wanted to make my suggestion for what we should watch next, which we, we can talk about as we end up the up ep- and the episode here. Uh, but I, I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed this movie. Mm-hmm. And I honestly did not think I was going to. All right. Well, that's good. Now. We've talked before about how some of the films just, you know, films in general, sometimes the making of or the story of the film is sometimes more interesting than the film itself. Hmm. Is this one of those situations? Are you about um, to? Uh, yeah, I'm going to tell you a little bit about this film. A um, little bit of history that I learned here. 
So, <laughs> when this film came out in 1937, uh, uh, people like FDR said, anyone who's in a democracy needs to see this film. Anyone who believes in democracy needs to see this film. On the other side, uh, you have Joseph uh, Goebbels, the propaganda master of the Nazi party that said this film is public enemy number one. Oh, God. It's so goddamn telling when a piece of art is supported by one side and denied by the other. It just shows you the dichotomy between worldviews. Yes. And and you can find which worldview side you're on by who you agree with. <laughs> and I am very much in FDR's camp on this. You didn't even need to tell me it was a, a you know, propaganda master himself. You didn't even have to tell me it was him. I'd still would have side with FDR, <laughs> but even more so. Like, yeah, uh no. <laughs> so, I'm not the story's not done yet. Oh god. So, Germany in World War II, Germany invaded France. And one of the goals of the Nazi party was to destroy every copy of this film. That's even more telling. And um, they were very successful, actually, um, to the point where they had lost... Or nobody knew where the original negatives for this film were. Oh, God. So there were some that were, you know, in film houses in in different countries. Mussolini, this is actually one of his favorite films. So he had a copy of it, but he probably didn't tell Hitler about it. (laughs) So um, in the honey, honey, Adolf's coming over. Hide the fine China and uh, the Jewish gold and the Grand Grand Illusion. Um. (laughs) So in the sixties, um, there was a push like like to to get some of these films out again, especially this film, which which came out right before World War II and could have been missed. Um, so um, cuts were given. Film was given to Jean Renoir to, to recut it or you know put it together again, the original cut. Mm-hmm. But uh, the film that he had, there were there were a lot of. Um, scenes that were very hard to see or, or, you know, kind of eaten through. Yeah. yeah. There were, um, the, the speech of the German, um, uh, captain, uh, Rothenstein, mm-hmm. they, it was corrupted to the point where they asked Eric von Strahlheim if he could come in and re re-record his lines. Oh yeah. Um, and before they could do that, he died. Uh, that's a shame. So, so they had to work with what they had. So it, it it wasn't great, but it was the best that they had. Mm-hmm. Um, go forward about 30, 40 years. And the original um, negatives were found. Oh, wow. That's a, so, that is a miracle. So That's what happened scenario. is that the um, the Nazi who was in charge of like film collecting and all that, he mm-hmm. knew the importance of this film. Wow. That's so before incredible. all the other copies and all the other films that the Nazis wanted destroyed were mm-hmm. burned down. And this is on nitrate film. So it's very flammable, very flammable. Yes, um, he <laughs> snuck it out. Wow. And he had it somewhere else. <clears throat> That's incredible. He was in contact with somebody in France at the time, too, and they were just kind of going back and forth. Um, but nobody talked to one of these two guys in the 60s when they were looking for that version of the film. So that it mm-hmm. just kind of sat in the vaults wow. until it was found in 2000 or so. That's that's incredible. <coughs> that, what a what a gift like that's almost almost as important as the story of the movie itself about the humanity of people that yeah. there would be this German soldier, this Nazi who was like, I can't do this. I cannot destroy this movie. And, and uh, are we the baddies? Yeah. <laughs> so, so then, yeah. So the version that you and I saw was the best version that there could be. Cause the film was preserved perfectly. 
That's incredible. And, and I watched the Criterion box. I did not see. I watched the. I streamed it. I didn't actually have the physical copy of it, <coughs> but I watched the Criterion Collection version, and yeah. it, it looked great to me. Like it was yeah. flawless. Yeah. So it it and you know and all the 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 language and and everything like the the dialogue was was now great for everyone too. It was very clear. The music was very clear. Like these are the, all the things that it corrupted because it's they're watching film, which is a copy of a copy of a copy. Right. So it it, it corrupts. So so yeah. Unfortunately, Jean Renoir was had had passed away. Um, you know, twelve years prior to it being or twenty two years prior to it being found. Mm-hmm. Um, but it is something. Yeah, it's the gift that we can see this film now. Um, and and, and be as sure because. Who knows how many other films, you know, I mean, they say that about like so many films of the silent era are just gone. Yeah. There's just snippets it, of them because there was burnt. no preservation. Yeah. There's no, no preservation. preservation. Um, about, well, can we just take a moment to appreciate the the how wild it is that Jean Renoir's dad was the expressionist painter? Yeah. This is one generation removed from like one of the greatest painters of all time. And then this filmmaker and then he died. 12 years before this was restored, like time is weird. <laughs> it, it is. I mean, it just tells you like how, you know, that era was not that long ago. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it, there's, when you really think of the grand scheme of a hundred years of film, if you want to go back further and start with Thomas Edison and wrote and wrote rotos- or not rotoscoping, um, uh, zoetropes, it's incredible to see how far the advancements of, of film and technology have gone. Mm-hmm. And then to just go back to this movie itself and talk about how the themes remain poignant. That's just as incredible as this discovery of this film. Discovering some crappy piece of Laurel and Hardy nothingness, right? Like that's, oh, okay, they're, they're comedic legends or whatnot. That, that's not changing the world. There's something incredible about finding a movie like this, restoring it, and it being su- such an important film historically, and for the themes to be still valuable to to this day. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 definitely one of those stories that it's like it's like oh oh oh, oh. And, you know where like like every turn like like and and it's like nobody knew where this was, and everyone thought it was destroyed, and it's like this is the best we can do. And then, then to find it, wow. um, beautiful. That we, we, that's not the first time one of these has happened because Metropolis was also rediscovered. So, yeah, but yeah, that and that was even a wilder story. Mm-hmm. But you know, again, for a film to be, for a film to be nominated, first foreign film ever to be nominated for best film, best mm-hmm. picture, um, and to be essentially lost. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty, uh, pretty impressive. I, I, yeah. I would say, um, and again, I, I will go in and I, I will sit with criterion and say, this <laughs> is an essential film. You, it, it, I don't I mean, you're sitting with mad magazine or something like that. I'm just saying <laughs> essential smell essential. Mm, well, to, in, in my defense, it's and this just goes to it's not necessarily goes to taste per se, but it's what do you want from film? Yeah. What do you want from cinema? And oh no, a a, lot a, of, absolutely. Well, I have sat here and I've praised this movie top to bottom. Uh, a lot of what I find in film is escapism. I like escaping with Marty McFly and Doc Brown or Indiana yeah. Jones or Alan Grant ch- being uh, chased by a T Rex. Like the escapism of cinema is something that's important to me. But that doesn't mean I don't, I can't acknowledge the greatness of something like this. It really just comes down to a matter of taste. So we we can disagree on the essential quality of of a movie. Yeah, and and I I will say that when I saw this in film school, like it it left an impression on me, but um, it it wasn't my favorite film that I saw from even Jean Renoir. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and I haven't seen rules of the game since then either, but, um, like I, I feel I have a, a better understanding of this film, seeing it like the second time and, and having my life in a different place as well. Oh, certainly. Um, 
But, I, I, you know, I, I do feel that this is one of those films that you come back to and just, like, see something else or get something else out of it. Because I, I definitely did, like, like this time, just understanding more of what, you know, by having one, the, the one main Jewish character in this film survive to the end. Yeah. And, and to show, again, you know, he's he's uh giving he is he's you know one of the nicer guys early on and and you know and and you know to show the one black soldier that's true yeah that you know he's doing all this stuff but he's just everyone's ignoring him you know and just like showing this so people can see it and then react to it um you know, it's it's again, I, I think it goes more to Jean Renoir being a very brave filmmaker at the time, because, I mean, he's he's not that far away from France. I think he he did get out of France before the war got really bad, before the Nazis invaded France, um, yeah. came, came to the United States. But um, but yeah, it's it's. I, I, and there's, there's something even more incredible about this coming up in 1937. Now, you're speaking to all these very truths, all these truths of the creation of the film when it came out, the reaction to the film. It's just that much more powerful knowing that World War II is right around the corner. Yeah. They, they, they didn't know that. When they're making this movie, They there's probably the fear that, dear God, dear God in heaven, don't ever let us as a world experience this again. Yeah. We cannot experience this again. And and not long after, while people were probably still thinking about this movie, it began, and it began, yeah. and it, be, it was worse and more horrible than it was before in yeah. so many ways. And and knowing that aspect of the film adds this entire layer to it that makes it all the more powerful of a, of a of a watch. Yeah, I I, I, I I've I, I think it's like sitting down watching this film. And you get German soldiers and like films of this time period, like that are put in this time period. Usually the Germans are always the bad guys. Sure. sure. So that is the immediate like, oh, they're the bad guys. Mm -hmm. But just again, the way that, you know, the German soldiers, uh, Marischal had, had injured his arm. So he the German soldier leans over and cuts the steak cuts for his him. Meat for, yeah, yeah. So he can eat. Uh, uh, the German prison guard sees Marshall in solitary confinement, brings him in a harmonica so he doesn't go crazy. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, it, again, just like the, the humanizing and, and, you know, this is before the, uh, obviously the atrocities of, of World War II and what, you know, what the, the German, the Nazi army did. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, 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 it gives an important message to everybody, whether you're the, the prisoner or the prison guard, like just remember we're all people. We're, we're all people. human. And and something interesting about this movie is that it's not crushing. This is not a depressing watch mm -hmm. despite the content. It's not a crushing viewing and it's not an <laughs> overly flag waving propagandist. Right. Like you watch a movie. I mentioned white Christmas. I love white Christmas, but it's very like, Oh gee, it's great to be in the army. Like it's very, very patriotic. Yeah. And while it shows the sadness of war, it colors it very brightly and whatnot. And John Wayne movies and, and John, like those movies are very much of the uh, look how great and brave and wonderful we are as soldiers. <laughs> and it doesn't really go into places of humanity. So, so yeah. Well, just on that point, um, not only did was this film banned in Germany. But soon afterward, like when World War II started, this film was banned in France, in Belgium, and other countries because they didn't want sympathizers. Uh, well, well, they they didn't want you know people to, yeah to to be pacifists then. Sure, sure. You know, and they didn't want people to think like that. So, so they they it, it wasn't able to be watched, even though you know people like FDR are saying anyone who believes in democracies needs to watch this film. Uh, when war broke out, it's like, OK, we can't watch this film. Let's we pull want, that one we back. We don't want people. We don't want that middle, that, that big, that big, gigantic, normal, everyday middle people to go. Wait a minute. 
90 percent of the population yeah there's it's it's no no one really wants to go to war except the warmongers and yeah. the profiteers they they want to go to war no, yeah. no normal decent human being uh, i think it's even like saving pride ryan is another great obviously one of the all-time great world war ii movies yeah. and humanity that's explored in there and schindler's list right like there's there's all these world war ii movies that are so crushingly human and and sad and i'm grateful that something like this which has such a clear and deep message to to be explored and dissected and and over analyzed I didn't walk away from this like, God, I just, I need to like pop in a, I need to pop in like a Looney Tune or something. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it does. So yeah, it, it does have an uplifting ending, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, in a way, I mean, you, there's you, hope. You, yeah, there's hope. They, they got, they got into Switzerland, the German soldiers, even though they saw them, they're like, oh, they're in Switzerland, they're safe. You know, you know that they're probably going to be put right back into the war. Um, and and so so one of the original endings that Jean Renoir had was that uh, in the first prison camp when they're with a bunch of other French POWs, they said, "Hey, when this is done, let's all meet at this cafe." Yeah, let's and, make let's make plans. That's that's that always works out in war yeah. movies. <laughs> and and so the end of the film was going to be all of them at the cafe. Except for Rosenthal and and Marisol, mm -hmm. there's two empty seats. Uh, that that was the original ending. That was one. Yeah, that was the original ending that that he thought about it. Mm -hmm. But he changed it to this one. I I f I like this better. I can see. I do too. But honestly, that that sort of ending would lead over <laughs> overthinkers to go. They were all dead, and the two empty chairs were the living. Yeah. You know. <laughs> <laughs> well then, then we could say that this film inspired Lost. Yes, oh, yeah. <laughs> so the the other thing that I like too, I, I and I think you know, um, I I was um, starting to get to this point before, um, but we always see the Germans as as the bad guys in films, sure, because of World War II, because of Nazism, mm -hmm. um, and and. Every, all you know, everything trademark. So when you go into Star Wars, the you know all the stormtroopers and all, they're literally called stormtroopers. Yeah, <laughs> they're all they're all based on the on the World War Two Nazi uh, army. Having a film based in World War One, it's not obviously not as common to have. There's not many films made currently that are world war one I. I think there's um christopher nolan had one out recently um yeah uh the kingsman the king's man is world war one is it world war one era yeah that yeah. first one but what was the christopher nolan dunkirk uh dunkirk's world war two isn't it no it's world war one mm, okay i'm gonna fact check you while you continue to talk you to your point i mean i you know i did have the criterion collection note but anyway <laughs> you didn't doubt me but uh yeah so so th there's not many world war one films to see like how how did these countries how did these people interact prior to like you know what we consider nazism mm. to destroy all that right like to make yeah. to make germans the villains in all the indiana jones films and yeah, but even spielberg himself started feeling bad about that because he didn't want to diminish the import of how horrible what they did was and yeah dunkirk does put, take place during world war ii sorry what? i'm sorry fly boys you're talking about fly boys that's the movie that you were thinking of with airplanes during world war one you're thinking of the james franco mm. airplane world war one movie mm. fly boys i, I can know. see how you get the two confused they're very similar <laughs> well that just that just is better for me because it proves my point that there's more World War II movies. This is true. Yes. <laughs> and we don't see a lot I just of World War I. Movies. I just didn't want the uh, listeners to come after you. So I'm I'm here I'm here for them right now. Yeah. Mm, Chris. You're Chris. 
<laughs> supposed to support me on this. I've and essentially, if we, if, we, if we have to change history, we have to change history. <laughs> I, now, my next couple of days, I'm going to be going on IMDb and Wikipedia and changing all that to World War One. <laughs> You're just going to update. Like it should be. <laughs> like it should be. No, but you know, I, I you know, I, yeah, there, there are very few World War One movies made. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and yeah, it's, it's refreshing to see, um, see this film. And again, one in an era where, where somebody was really trying to push for peace. Yeah. Um, in a time where, where, yeah, tensions were very high. Hitler was crazy. And, and yeah, the I world, don't know. The world is on, is on the, uh, is about to end. This is what's about yeah. to happen for, for the majority of the planet and, yeah, you know, and and to have the enemy call your film, the you know public enemy number one, public public enemy number one. That's yeah. now we got to now we got to watch it. Yeah, exactly. All right. Yeah. So let's wrap up the show. I think um, um, the vote is uh, two to one that this is an essential film. <laughs> you outrank um, me. <laughs> no. Myself and Criterion. Oh, yes, you are correct. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, if it's a top 10 film, it should be at least one vote from them. Um, yeah. and, and and you made a good case that this is a very good film. You would just doubt the essentialness of it. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I, I could see that. I mean, um, your point that you hadn't heard of this film before. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not to say only movies I've heard of should be considered essential films. Right. But it is, right. It, I did take that into consideration of like, I'd never even heard of this, but now I'm really glad I watched it. I'm glad you suggested it. I, I did have a really nice time watching it and, and I'm, and I had an even better time chatting with you about it. Yeah. So I would say, watch it. I would say, uh, I mean, if, if, you know, I, I think if, if you look at a cinematography, if you look at, um, how to write a story, especially knowing that you're not, it's a French film, but it's not only in French. Yeah. And it's a swift viewing too. So it's yeah. just a shade under two hours, but it didn't feel it. And I, I know that's a weird compliments, but I do think that films that have a good pace to them and are edited and perform in such a fashion that you lose yourself in them, that yeah. the two hours will like slip by like that. Yeah. Yeah. So this film is before the seven samurai. That's number two. Yes. By the oh, way. there we go. There I'm we Criterion. Go. <laughs> so. Well, thanks for having me on to, to chat about this. And, of course. And, well, and thank again, you. I will. I thank you for introducing me this to to this movie. Beautiful. And uh, we're 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 still debating on what the next film will be. We have some really good ideas, but if you have any suggestions, please send them our way. Yeah. Um. And yeah, thank you all very much for listening. Oh, and uh, be sure to use oh. coupon code film oh, yeah. illogical or film film ill. I film think film ill. Yeah, film film Ill, Ill if you want to get your uh, Swiss Alps gentleman snowshoes. For yeah, the two the for one. For your winter escape. Yeah, you, yeah. you'll get the two for one if you use hashtag Film, well, film Ill. <laughs> I thought it was you paid for two and you get one. I think that sounds like the yeah. information I have in front of me. Too. Yeah, you pay for two and you get one. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Filmological Society. If you'd like to listen to similar podcasts, please check out 6.5 Media on Stitcher, iTunes, and Facebook. Or check out Redacted Media on Facebook and YouTube. <laughs>